Hello and welcome along to the RTE Rugby Podcast on one of the busier weeks of rugby news. Six Nations squad being announced. We have a new Ireland captain. Champions Cup pool stages are coming to a conclusion at the weekend. There's contract news. Louis Rees Ahmed is off to the NFL. And a little bit later, I'll be chatting to Ali Yeager about his move from the Crusaders to Munster and his call up as well to the uh, extended part of the uh, the Irish squad ahead of the Six Nations. That's coming up a little bit later in the show. First, I'm joined by Bernard Jackman. And Birch, we've got a, a fairly full slate of news to get through over the next while. Yeah, big day. Obviously, other countries um, had announced their squads uh, over the last 24 hours and, and a little bit before. And obviously, Ireland now, Andy Farrell, this afternoon picked the squad and it's, it's very much... The tried and trusted, really, isn't it? Um, you know, the players who went to the World Cup, by and large, are are, are still there. Um, some of the older veterans like Keane Healy and, and Conor Murray and Peter Mahoney are, are are back for another campaign. And, and Pete obviously has been given the captaincy, which is a, a huge, a uh, huge honor for him. And I mean, the timing, you know, he was injured, um, but got back last week to to play for Munster and be play a big role in that win against Toulon and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, and also there's lots of talk about his con- and being off contract, and maybe Munster hadn't made him an offer. So, I mean, what's the repercussions of this? Is is this going to force the RFU's hand to extend his central contract or, or, or what? But it's uh, it's fascinating. Yeah, it certainly is. So to go through the the broad stroke details, um, Peter Omani is the captain. It's a thirty four man squad, nineteen forwards, fifteen backs. In the forwards, Nick Timoney is the the standout inclusion, I suppose, the, the eye-catching one. Keen Prendergast, Gavin Coombs, John Hodnett, Scott Penny as an example of some of the back rows who, who missed out. Jack Crowley, Kieran Frawley and Harry Byrne are the three out-halves. Calvin Nash, Jacob Stockdale and Jordan Larmer are included as the, the outside backs who get in after the injuries to Jimmy O'Brien and Mac Hansen. No place for Simon Zebo or Rob Balakoon. And then in addition to the 34-man squad, you have Tom Hearn, Oli Yeager, and Sam Prendergast all going to train with the squad in the lead-up to the tournament as well. There's only one place to start in that, Birch, and Peter O'Mahony is the captain. Uh, you mentioned the contract stuff, and that puts an interesting slant on the selection, and I'll park that for a second, because initially I just want to get your, your thoughts on Peter O'Mahony as the, as the Ireland captain for this campaign. It's something he's done, filled in on... on a handful of occasions throughout his career. He's done it for Munster countless times, did it for the Lions once as well. Um, a deserved accolade for him? Look, absolutely. He's a clear-cut candidate um, to be the next captain of the Giants section, except you're, you're not sure... Uh, sorry, there was um, a wonder or question would Farrell actually try and blood the most likely captain for the next World Cup cycle? And um, maybe Peter's going to go all the way to Australia... Um. Uh. And that that's 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 the goal that's been set out firm. And you know there is that continuity that Far wants. Or literally, he just said, "Look, this is a tricky campaign. Um. Uh. Obviously, France and England away. We want to have the most experienced player and the most uh, suitable to captaincy. And he's he is suited to captaincy. Uh, but I think that's that was the question mark. Obviously, he had the injury as well, so he hasn't played a lot in 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 the last uh five or six weeks. But was good last week and. He gets back in. So from a Farrell point of view, I think it does make sense short term. Um, and I suppose he you know it's a long way to the next World Cup. So he probably feels if Pete drops out of this team because of form or injury, um, he'll find an, another successor. But uh yeah, great, great honor for him. And then the the interesting wrinkle in it then as well is um what it means for his future and how much we can read into it that he's that he's captain. Reported yesterday, obviously, that there's nothing on the table as of yet for him from from either Munster or the IRFU with his contract expiring at the end of this season. A message from Gianni Rivera on Twi- on uh, on X, formerly known as Twitter, with a man his contract expiring at the end of the season. Is he a stopgap appointment as captain to see us through to the Six Nations and the summer tour to South Africa? Two schools of thought on on it, Birch. There's first of all. You could think Andy Farrell is giving O'Mahony this this honor to lead the team into the summer, and as as was suggested, like a stopgap towards someone else stepping up further down the line. The second part of that is if he's potentially the captain beyond this summer, does does this make it a bit more likely that he's getting an IRFU extension rather than a monster contract extension? Uh, it's it's very. Um... 
it's interesting. So uh, my understanding is that he was coming off a central contract, um, and that that would have made sense if he wasn't going to be captain, um, and unfortunately or for whatever reason, the Munster weren't in a position to offer him a contract. So, and and the the problem for Munster is even though his he probably would take less money now, or was would have been uh, you would imagine he would have been um agreeable to that because he wants to he wants to keep playing my understanding is and, and wants to keep playing for Munster um but effectively he goes from being a zero cost player for Munster to being a cost so mm. if you're trying to if you're trying to cut your overall budget um contracting players that you've already had for free um is is counterproductive so whether this is a great game this is a game of chess that Munster are playing um or if they were if it was just a situation that they had to try and I suppose manage the books next year and and drop their budget or or use a budget differently. I don't know, but this is a um this is this is changed the whole uh, the whole situation now because if if he performs in this Six Nations, which no doubt he will, if he's the player that Far thinks Ireland need next year uh, to be captain and and he's going to do another season at least. <laughs> A season the fire isn't going to be there for the Six Nations, and you could argue having you know someone of Pete's experience as captain uh, would help with that, would help with the mm-hmm. the, the other coaches, etc. There's an argument that actually you you recontract them on a central contract. Um, you know, if if like captain of Ireland should be on a central contract, you know? 100%. so and he, and, and he is at the moment, he is yeah. like so he is for the Six Nations. Um, but if he is going to be the captain next year. He should be on a central contract, which I'm sure Munster. Uh, uh, like I, uh, I would be shocked if there wasn't money involved uh, or in, in the decision if they if Munster weren't contracting him or, or weren't contracting him yet. Um, but if that con- if that decision is taken away from Munster and it's done by there, if you, well, you know, Munster are going to benefit from from Peter Mahoney uh, next year as well. But I suppose the other side of things is I suppose Munster <clears throat> probably felt. They had time on their side. Let him come back from his injury. Let's see how his form was. Um, and let's see how his body is and we can make a decision late on it. So, uh, you know, it, I, I would have been shocked if Pete... I, I'd be shocked if Pete Romani isn't playing for Munster next year if he wants to play and his body holds up. It's just who pays him um, now becomes a little bit less clear but more more exciting from or more probable that he, that he will stay, if you get me. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm getting you there. The other bits of info, and we'll we'll fire through these because there's so much to get through today. Um, if we're talking about the players selected, Nick Timoney is is chosen. Obviously, he's a he's he's one player who is in excellent form. There's no doubt about it. Um, there's there's a numbers game at play probably here as well. Where, um, if you look at the the players who were there for the World Cup and the players who were suggested, like as you know, Tom Hearn has been suggested obviously as well. It would have been quite heavy on the six and eight side mm. of things where they were probably missing some natural open side flankers to, to compliment Josh van der Fleer. Um, someone might suggest John Hodnett to go in there, but then at the same time, Nick Timoney can play seven and eight as well. So he's, it's, it's trying to pick between three or four players who are in very, very good form, but also players who can cover across different positions as well. It's very hard to say that, if you're trying to say say that one player like John Hodden or Thomas Hearn should be in the main squad or Gavin Coombs as well, it's very, very hard to say that one of those should be in there while also having to pick the player who drops out. Yeah, look at it. I think Hodden has had a, a, had a big start to season um, and is a very good player and, uh, and he'll get capped for Ireland. I, I, I'd be shocked if he doesn't. Timoney has been very consistent over the last couple of years. He's been in squads and found a little bit extra I think um over the last uh six or seven weeks, and again as you said, he can play eight, you know well. Um, I I would say the back rows are most competitive, competitive area. Um, and you know uh there is some players who are who haven't done a lot wrong. Prendergast hasn't done yeah um a huge amount wrong, and he's been quite good. Man, I'm matching a couple of games I've seen. Um, good line of option as well. Uh, but yeah, just. There's a lot of depth there, and Conan. To be fair, um, Conan and Pete haven't played a huge amount, but uh, obviously Farrell knows and trusts them, and likes what they can bring. So, um, yeah, it's it, there's certainly some some quality that's missed out in in, in that uh, that area. And I would have had I would have had 
Hearn in, in this, as a senior player, you know, but it's obviously, it doesn't really matter. Like, Farrell can pick Jaeger, Hearn, or, or Prendergast if he wants. Um, It gives them a great chance to go to camp next week in Portugal and show what they can do. Yeah, like, I mean, the three of them are down as, you know, they're they're in the training squad, essentially. Yeah. But if they turn up trees next week, they're they're in the main squad the following week. We can pretty much assume that, yeah? Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. And, uh, just, uh, yeah, it's just a way of classifying. Uh, in actual fact, it's probably, like, even Jaeger, given what he's done in the game, you know, he's probably not the type of player I expect to see in that, in that bracket. For me, it's usually a guy who's... You know, come in the under twenties, or, yeah. or or has it done a little bit less? But look, it doesn't really matter. It's 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 optics, really, isn't it? Yeah, just kind of want to have a have a look at them. And then the last few bits on the squad, um, Calvin Nash, and who have we got Calvin Nash, Jacob Stockdale, and Jordan Larmer are the the back three additions. Uh, to take into account Mac Hansen and, and Jimmy O'Brien's injury of those three, who do you think is is leading the race to wear number fourteen against France? I think Nash. I, I, I think Nash. Obviously, Stockdale is more experienced. Um, for me, he's much better on the left wing. I don't see them moving James Lowe. Um, Larmer's been good uh, and, and got a lot of game time and um, as impressed. But I just think Nash has a lot of momentum behind him. Even he gave a he gave a pretty good audition for it on yeah. on Saturday. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, on. Now Jordan Larmer scored two lovely tries as well. But Nash, when you're talking about the way Ireland play and the you know the the way they have wingers coming in off the yeah. field a lot, like you have to imagine Andy Farrell will be very impressed with what he saw on Saturday. Yeah, I think so. And I think it helps Nash's case that Munster and Ireland's attacking shape is very similar. Uh, Prendergast is, um, has has a lot of the same traits and what he does, particularly with his back three. And yeah, I, I think he's, I think this is the opportunity for, for Nash now with obviously so many injuries in the back three. Um, he's in form and he deserves a, a shot at the one last bit on it actually the it's light on light on fullbacks if yeah, very. Keenan, if you if Hugo Keenan was to you know pick up a little hamstring knock in the opening week or something like that what is your what you're thinking for who would go in there is it Jack Crowley well, Kieran Frawley or someone like Calvin Nash or Jacob Stockdale or yeah, or Jordan Larmer I I, I would have thought Larmer um Larmer like has has a lot of rugby under his belt a, a fullback um, I think Crowley starts ten, and and he's he's a key man for us. So I wouldn't be moving him around. I think Frawley, I don't think Frawley's done enough to start a fullback for Ireland. Um, ahead of some of those others. Um, Stockdale can play fullback as well, but I would I would have thought that Jordan Larm was was next in line. I think we're we're weak in that position in terms of um players who are playing there every 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 um every week. We don't have that at the moment uh, in this in this group. But for me, I would be keeping Frawley on the bench because uh, he covers so many positions uh, and Jack Crowley would stay at 10 and Jordan Larmer would come in at fullback for me. A message from Ian Frizzle on X. Given the makeup of the other squads in terms of experience and obvious emissions, will Ireland ever be with him at a better chance of back-to-back Grand Slams? Um, I don't I don't see a Grand Slam first, uh, to be honest. I know we've, we've gone very we've gone very steady Lots of good players played some great stuff last year, and obviously, if we can bounce back into that, maybe we, maybe I should be a little bit more um, ambitious. But uh, I still think this team is going to have to rebuild a little bit, even though it's only really was it Johnny Sexton is, is the is the obvious person who, who's left us. Um, England, France away, France I think would be very good. England probably be better than they were by a good bit last year. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't see Grand Slam this year, and, and uh, unfortunately, and uh, uh, maybe I'm being pessimistic. But yeah, I, that wasn't what jumped in my mind. I, I look at. I don't think Wales are strong. Um. I don't think Scotland. I think we beat Scotland. We beat Italy. It's just I would fear. I would fear France first up. You know, we may win win all but one of our games uh, and win a championship, but um, I don't think we get a Grand Slam. When you look at the squads as well that have been announced in the the last few days, like this Six Nations, it does have the potential for for kind of anything to happen. Like you know, Ireland coming into it without Johnny Sexton, now they've had a couple of injuries as well on top of it. Antoine Dupont gone for France. Now I know the you know the, they still look pretty sweet all round. Um, England bit of a changing in the guard. Owen Farrell stepping back, and they've had a lot of changes to their squad. 
Um, it does have the potential for something mad to happen almost. Yeah, no, it, it, look, it does. Um, but I, I don't see the winner coming outside Ireland, England, or France. And as I said, for me at the moment, France, France looked to be in the best possible place. The punt gone is a, is a big blow, but um, no, I, 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 uh, I think they've got the depth there and home advantage against us. Marseille, place to be buzzing, you know, power game that they can have. Yeah, I, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be back in France to win the, the Six Nations this year. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, We'll park the Six Nations for now. Investec Champions Cup is where we're going next. Uh, coming off a mixed weekend for the Irish provinces, Leinster made light work of a pretty poor Stade Francais side at the Aviva Stadium. Munster, as we mentioned, produced their best of the season uh, in France to all but guarantee themselves a, a place in the last 16 of the tournament. Ulster were blown apart by Toulouse and Antoine Dupont's mini farewell before he goes goes off to play sevens. While Connacht lost away to Lyon, they now need a, a miracle to get through to the next round, to be totally honest. We'll start with the result of the round. Munster 29-18 winners away to Toulon and Birch despite the fact that they went 10-0 down they were full value for us in the end yeah it was a, it was a brilliant uh, result for them and a great performance and um, I thought they showed tactical smarts and, and, and kicked a lot better kicked more and that opened up opportunities obviously to, to counter-attack and um, it's full of energy it was a typical Munster performance in well, sorry what we expect of Munster in the European Cup where they just find that extra extra 10% or 15%. Obviously, they, they got bodies back from injury and that was key. Um, uh, but, like, I think Toulon only lost four times in, in Europe or something at home or something ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, they were, they were great value for it. So, uh, Toulon aren't going that well and I thought Munster could beat them. But when you look at some of the players that Toulon have um, uh, and where Munster are coming from, obviously, on the back of some really difficult uh, results, you know, huge... Um, Injury crisis, and got back and 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 it was excellent. It was like now it gives it sets up Saturday for against Northampton, perfectly, doesn't it? I mean, um, it's amazing how things can turn around so quickly. It is. It's it's absolutely bonkers. Where this day a week ago we were talking about how Munster's last sixteen hopes were nearly hanging by a thread, and a week later with a game to spare in the pool, they are they need a, a wild set of results to go against them to to miss out on a place in the in the last sixteen. Um, a good few players across that match day twenty three pulled out arguably their best performances of the season, but one player I do want to single out was Niall Scannell having returned for for his first game of the season after a long term injury, and we spoke about we've spoken for a good while now about the struggles Munster have had in the lineouts and it went pretty decent on Saturday. There's there's a bit of an element with Niall Scannell where he's not one of the the standout players that we talk about week on week, but I think it's very much an element of you don't really know what you've got until it's gone, is it? Yeah, there was all kinds of rumours about his injury maybe being career-ending or and Munster obviously are apparently in the market for um, a high-profile non-IQ or non-IQ hooker. We're talking about Grobbler from the, from the Bulls is, is the rumour, but I thought that was incredible by Scannell to come back from having not played for a while um, he's not a big man. He's not the most powerful, you know, ball carrier. Very good set piece. Very good scrummager. Very good thrower. Um, but I thought some of his defensive uh, hits, you know, he he just laid down a marker and and uh, you know lasted lasted way longer probably than than you would have than you would have expected. And uh, I thought it was a massive statement by him. And and he looks so much better uh, with him in 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 the team. The, the set piece was, was strong. It was a brilliant comeback from him and, and shows he's got plenty of ruby left in. It was, yeah. And like, we look at this weekend, we're kind of moving quickly through some of these games, but this weekend, uh, the difference now for Munster this week, uh, we've seen them pull out big results when their backs are against the wall, like last weekend and quite a few times last season as well. Um, The difference now is, and it's where Munster need to kick on to another level, there's a big difference between pulling out those results when your back's against the wall and doing it when it's actually expected of you. And while it is expected of Munster this weekend, they're still coming up uh, a pretty good and pretty informed Northampton team who are uh, three wins out of three, th- or 16 tries in three games in the Champions Cup and top of the Premiership as well. Um, 
this is this is a big game and a big opportunity for Munster to to back things up. Yeah, this is huge, and like they kind of have to now. They they they've um they've had that little blip, um, and we know the reasons why. But then they've turned it around. They've beaten Toulon, and like Northampton, they look great against Bayonne. They've been in good form this year, um, but they won't get anything like the time and space that they they have been getting. Um, in Toma Park, if if Munster are on uh on form and, and up for it, and, and like they have to be, so you really hope. Obviously, this is the last game they'll play for a while together. Players will go to Irish camp. There's a bit of a break in the URC, and you just, I'd love to see Munster just put out another big performance and show that they're contenders. You know, like the URC champions should have aspirations to go really deep in the in the Champions Cup, and whether they have enough depth in their squad. Uh, etc enough quality um that'll be that remains to be seen but if they were to lay down another big performance and put this northampton team away convincingly they have a right then to be talked about as as potential um champions particularly given how they manage that knockout stage of the urc with obviously the three away wins in a row they have a lot of belief from that and uh um yeah it, it's going to be really interesting to see if they can do it again yeah um God knows who they would be playing in a quarter final because there's just so many permutations going on. It was funny though, I was looking at the the pool the pool tables and some of the likely results. And obviously, for if you're a team like Munster or Ulster as well, trying to trying to sneak through, you obviously want to get as best a seeding as you as you possibly can to avoid, we'll say, having to travel to to Leinster potentially or to or to Toulouse in the next round. But there's <laughs> there's a really, really tricky possibility for someone that the Stormers could sneak in as the the fourth place of those home or fourth or or eighth place of those home last 16 opponents and you could end up finishing the best of the rest and end up having to go away to the stormers in the in the last 16 um we'll see how it all plays out anyway we'll move on to Leinster though 43 seven winners against Stade Francais in a bit of a dud of a game at the Aviva Stadium um in fairness Leinster did score some nice tries to entertain people um it was funny though on Saturday Birch in the Aviva and I was thinking about uh we're talking about number eight and uh, if ever there was something to, to sum up, like why someone like Gavin Coombs only has a couple of Irish caps, he goes out against Toulou- Toulon and absolutely plays his best game of the season. He was outstanding. And then Caelan Doris walks out at the Aviva Stadium and just shoots the lights out for an hour for 60 minutes before getting a, a standing ovation to come off. Yeah, Doris is, is, is proper world class. And, and yeah. yeah, when you think of of his age profile um, and, you know, the length of time he's probably going to keep playing at, for Leinster in Ireland, um, he can do great things in the game because he's just such a good athlete he, he, and he's tough, he works hard, um, he's got good footballing ability um, and he's the real deal and it's mostly demoralising for some of the other eights when when they see him put in that kind of performance. I know he, he, he's very good whenever he plays, whatever, but he just can do things that unfortunately some of the others can't. Um, and yeah, that's why there was a bit of a push, maybe potentially rumours that he was going to be the Irish captain. Uh, and he may yet in time, but, um, you know, he, he, whether he's captain or not, he's going to be a starter for Ireland um, as long as he stays fit. And that's, yeah, as you say, as long as he stays fit, there's, I know he had the concussion issues earlier in his career, but since, since he came back from that in the summer of 2021, his durability is absolutely remarkable. He's played in every single Ireland game since the mm-hmm. summer of 2021. You're talking yeah. 28, 29 games, and I think he started all but one or two of those as well. Like, to be playing in the back row at that level yeah. and consistently be available week on week is is phenomenal on top of the fact that he's an, an outstanding player as well. And I think that's that's where I would say the the Irish player management protocol or or the player welfare here works. So he had picked up a couple of concussions um in a reasonably short space of time and they just withdrew him. They withdrew him and you know let it settle down, make sure he got the best medical attention. And then he goes and, and becomes really robust and, and can play. Whereas sometimes you can see players playing quite quickly, you know, again and, and not taking the sufficient rest time. And it just becomes something that they kind of have you know, worried about them during during the their during their career and maybe can cut cut their career short. So whereas I don't agree with I agree with that. I think it's brilliant. I don't agree with basically, you know, um rest by numbers where 
player plays in four match match day twenty threes, and um for a five in a five over short period and three of them are on the bench, you know, and yet they have to take the, the, the next week off. I don't really agree with that, but I think that's that's the value there. A case like that where someone like Doris is just given the appropriate time to rest and then let them go and play and. Um. Yeah. It, it's uh. If we are going to go back to back, as Ian says, um, Grand Slams, you know, Doris, you'd imagine would be the heart of it. Hey, I might skip Ulster and go to Connacht. Then I was planning to mention Ulster now, but since you mentioned the the player minutes and the player player management, Bundyaki and Finley Bealham obviously didn't play for Connacht in Leon at the weekend and are available this weekend. And I think a lot of people would have been frustrated that they weren't out there for Connacht at the weekend and losing against Leon. You know, they get a win in that game. It puts them back in a decent position to, to springboard on and qualify. Um, On the flip side, though, there is the side of it that, you know, it was Connacht's choice not to play them in that game. They had the choice to play them in one or, one or two, one of these two games. Bundyaki was a travelling reserve, for example, in, in Leon. You could see him over there on the, on the camera. What are your thoughts on that? Would... Should Connacht have prioritized getting a win on the board first up, or mm. I presume you know obviously they, they kind of want to have them for a big game at, at home against Bristol. It's I'm it's caught between one. I'm caught between having sympathy for Connacht in this situation, but also the them kind of thinking a game ahead. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a difficult one. Like we need to know how both as individuals, you know, uh, present themselves. At start of last week, and you know what kind of shape they were in, but it does look like they they prioritized the home game, and now the home game is a effectively a dead rubber, isn't it? Um, so yeah, you and you think if Bundy and Phelan played, they could have won that. I think probably they probably got closer to Leon than they maybe maybe expected um, on the day. But I, I I feel Bundy plays better when he plays regularly, um, and I, and I he hasn't come back to top top form. And look at. Maybe he never will. Never, he never get back to the level he got in the World Cup because it was, you know, it was definitely the best block of games he's ever played. And and like when you look at Bundy's career, he's been like really, really good uh, at different stages of it. So, um, I suppose it was there's bound to be a little bit of um of a dip, but probably knowing him, you know, the big games in the Six Nations will will get him back there. But um, certainly I I would have you know. Imagine Connacht had won that. Um, I think Bristol are there for the taking. They're pretty poor at the moment, um, very up and down. Connacht maybe had a better chance of beating Bristol without Finney beating him and Bundy than um than they had of beating Leon. Um, or, or yeah, with with without them in that, or they would have beaten Leon with them. I think. Um, certainly, a, a Bundy Yaki at full strength potentially could have been a difference there. And then Ulster 48-28 defeat to to lose at the weekend. We spoke of the opportunity they had last week to kind of lay down a marker and say, you know, we're we are here now for the season. They were ultimately just just blown apart by a pretty outstanding team, and you know, one man in particular, Antoine Dupont. Yeah, Dupont was was ridiculous. Um, even though he made some errors, he was like some of the things he did. There's no one in the world can do them. Um, but I think Ulster, I think Ulster needs to be better. Like. Than that and uh, Toulouse looked really, really good, but they're giving way too much time and space. Um, and to concede what well, was a 48 points at home, yeah, in a European Cup match on the back of obviously having had you know two really good um performances and results against Leinster and, and Racing, a win against Connacht. You just think, right, it's, you know, that game was sold out, it was just an opportunity for them to to really kick on and not maybe not win if, if they're not able to beat Toulouse at home. At the moment, that's fine. Um, and uh, and there is a bu- difference in budget and experience and quality, but you just I don't know. I I just thought Ulster were were far too easy um to to beat, and I don't think Toulouse are are as good as they looked at the at the weekend. Um, I think Ulster made them helped them play their type of game. Uh, stood off them too much, um, and paid the price. And and but I don't think I think. There's a lot of other teams who aren't as talented as, as Toulouse who make that game much closer and much more competitive. Yeah, like is it is it the nature of the fe- of the defeat rather than the defeat itself? Yeah, the fact, that, like, the fact that Ulster were playing out those last twenty minutes trying to to grab a four try bonus point yeah. rather than 
even if they were to lose by seven or eight points, but to be to be fighting for something in that context uh, in that contest in the last 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, I, I that's it. Like I, I'm not I'm not overly um, judging them on the loss. It was the the nature of it. The nature of it, I think, the Ulster. Um, that's that's why I've worried about Ulster. Is just that um, that ability just to to not give up, but to get blown and blown away, and it happens too often. And and unfortunately, um, like it shouldn't happen really after the, the period that they had, where they they really shown. Um, got some great three three decent wins, um, two spectacular wins, a, a game against Leinster where they were no goody, they were tough, they were um combative, and then home game against Toulouse in Europe and just weren't where they need to be. Yeah, so that was Ulster losing to Toulouse. They are taking on Harlequins away this Saturday. It's left them in a bit of a bind now, so they're on five points. Racing ninety two are on for Racing host Cardiff this weekend. Realistically, you're looking at a bonus point win for Racing there. So that'll, or the Racing are on three, I should say. Realistically, Racing are going to be up on eight points after after this weekend. So that means it's pretty much win or bust for Ulster. Even a draw with a bonus point wouldn't realistically do for them because Racing would rack up a, a far better bonus point uh, or points difference. So for Ulster, it's pretty simple. Win at Harlequins and you are through um anything less than that and it's uh it's curtains for the champions cup this season but we're running out of time i do want to ask you quickly though the the mad news that cropped up yesterday morning Louis Rees Samet leaving rugby with immediate effect he's going to florida he's going to try out with the nfl's international player pathway um to have a crack at earning a place on an nfl roster in the coming years a bolt out of the blue not least for warren gatland yeah i felt I felt sad or bad for Warren. He only had an hour's notice or something when he was about to name a squad, which um, it makes you believe that this all happened very late, or else it was. It's a sad indictment of their relationship. But um, well, well, I saw I saw Rizam would say, uh, or I saw it mentioned somewhere that the, he was first approached about it on Sunday. Yeah, so like that's this happened very very quickly. Yeah, and it's amazing. And like, look at I, I actually admire him to be honest. I mean, what a what an opportunity. Uh, I know like Christian Wade and some other players have have tried it, but if Reece Samet believes he can make a big a big impact over there, um, well, good on him. You know, it's an opportunity to maybe maybe he didn't look uh, seek out, um, but it's come along and he's a phenomenal athlete, um, and he's young enough to to be part of this program. Like financially, he's taken a big a big hit. I mean, apparently he had a big offer to go to Japan. Mm. Gloucester were rumored to be off willing to pay him. Circuit three hundred k a year. Obviously, he'd get his Welsh, um, parents money on top of that. Uh, and I, I think the starting salary, I think he starts on fifty grand or something like that. And if he makes a train squad, obviously it goes up. And obviously, if he makes a roster, it's it's phenomenal. You know, it's yeah. it's a couple of mil or whatever. Probably looking at, but uh, um, I I just admire him actually. Not taking the safe option, which is stay in rugby union. You know, uh, to go and do it, and he can come back. He can come back. I mean. Because back in a year's time, having failed, you know, he's not going to be short of, of, of options, but he'll never get that opportunity again. So, um, yeah, fair play to him. Yeah, like, I mean, he's 22 years old. If he gives this two years and it turns out to be a complete disaster, he's mm. he's returning to rugby as a 24-year-old uh, who's going to have a dozen good offers yeah. on the table from countries in England, Wales, France, Japan, you name it. I mean... There's, there's not really much to lose uh, for him in that regard. Um, That's all we have time for on this, Birch. We will chat to you again soon. Enjoy the games of the weekend. Are you in Thoman Park on Saturday? Uh, no, Bechtel play Seapoint in a must-win game. So I've had to pass on, on Thoman Park, unfortunately. Um, yeah, good. Good. Well, look, very best of luck to, to Bechtel this weekend. Um, That's it for this portion of the podcast. Coming up next, I will be chatting to Munster's Ali Yeager. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by Munster prop Ollie Yeager following the announcement that Pinergy will be the presenting partner for Munster's Clash of the Champions with the Crusaders at Porky Creeve on Saturday, February 3rd. Pinergy, sponsors of the Munster Senior Schools Cup, are continuing their support by sustaining the future of rugby in the province. Ali, thanks for joining us on the pod. And first of all, congratulations are in order. About half an hour before we hopped on this call, it was confirmed you'd be part of the extended training panel 
ahead of the Six Nations, yourself, Tom Ahern and, and Sam Prendergast supplementing the the thirty four man Six Nations squad. It must be a, a nice feeling to be to be hanging around and getting a sniff and being able to kind of look under the bonnet of, of Andy Farrell's system uh, just a couple of months after coming home. Yeah, thank you very much for having me as well. And um, yeah, no, it's an awesome feeling. Uh, it's a really, really cool feeling to have. Um, I, I was just coming home, you know, to play some rugby for Munster and, you know, focus on that kind of state of things. I didn't expect anything like this to happen too early, if anything, if at all. And um, I'm just stoked. I'm just stoked to be part of it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to ripping in. Had you been in touch with Andy over the, the last couple of months since coming home? Had he kind of just checked in with you or anything like that? Uh, no, no, no. I think uh, I, was, I was just came home and pretty much got settled in myself. I've only been back in Limerick for about a month and a half now, so I haven't really been here for too long. So um, still finding my feet in some ways, but I think it was just, you know, let me be me and kind of see how things go. And then obviously if I'm playing well enough, uh, I might hear from him. But uh, yeah. Just been doing my own thing and playing playing a bit of a footy. I'll I'll round back to the international stuff in a few minutes. It, first up though, how are you in general? Obviously, we you had that concerning incident on New Year's Day against Connox with the head injury. Um, a lot of people were probably a bit fearful. It was it was your neck even as well at the time, just with the the amount of treatment they were giving you on the pitch. Um, we spoke to the coaches over the last couple of weeks. You're working your way through the return to play protocols and and all of that is is going according to plan so far yes yeah everything's going according to plan so i'm much better than i was a couple of weeks ago i can say that for certain um obviously not the best way to start off new year uh it's not really the new year new me i had planned on doing but um i think like with those precautions that they did where you go off in the stretcher and have a lot that's all just precautionary uh i think with the head knock like that where you do go out for a wee bit or whatever they need to be be careful and you'd rather be too careful than not careful at all so i was walking once i got back into the changing sheds and everything so that was fine and stuff but yeah the last couple of weeks have been much better slowly making my way back into training and trying to get through things and uh seeing how we go and I as things are going to plan, is the is the hope to be available for this weekend? If you if you you hit all your criteria, obviously on the the return to play, hopefully, hopefully, yeah. So we've still got a few hoops to jump through, but um, nah, definitely, hopefully that's the plan. So the quicker I can get back, the better. And I obviously, I don't want to go back too early. And mm-hmm. if I'm not ready, I'm not ready. But I'm hoping to be good for the weekend. Yeah, well, good to see you're on you're on track anyway. So how has how has life been since coming back to Ireland? As you said, it's probably only six seven weeks now after a a pretty rushed move, and it all happened very fast as well. Like I remember the morning I was there at work, alarms were raised when your name wasn't on a Crusaders squad for the season. Rob Penny says, "Well, there's there's something coming you'll find out about in the next couple of days," and all of a sudden we're starting to put all the jigsaw pieces together and. Within a few days, it's it's confirmed by Munster. Can you talk us through the the chain of events that that brought you to that brought you to Munster? Yeah, I can. Um, so basically, it was just I'd put a message out saying, put my feelers out and seeing if I wanted to go home. That I wanted to go home, and uh, Munster was a one of the main guys who came up, and obviously I've been looking at them, and they clearly been looking at me, and it was I would like to think you know it was already planned as such and the bigger stars of things. But um, no, I just got a message early that they obviously had a couple of injury worries and stuff like that and things. And if I wanted to come back earlier than I planned, then yeah, it was all packed up and gone within six days, seven days, pretty much. So it was it was a quick rushed move, but it was um, as soon as I could go at home, the better I was kind of thing. So I just wanted to be back in Ireland and be back into, you know, close to family and stuff like that. And yeah, it all happened quick. I'm still trying to figure it out how it happened myself, but uh, it's all happened now. I'm home and uh, yeah, just trying to get a bit of a run on with the footy and trying to stay in the field. So had you like had you previously arranged to join, we'll say from next season and then they kind of approached you and said, well, there's a an immediate opportunity here if uh, if it all works out. Was that how it worked out or was, the initial, yes. was the initial contact about coming in immediately? Uh, no, so basically I'd already sorted out for next season and stuff like that. But um, yeah, as I said, obviously 
had a few injury worries and stuff like that and then the opportunity came to come a bit earlier um so yeah it's a bit of a you know head turning thing trying to figure out what I need what I wanted to do and what I what was the best decision but ultimately it was the best decision to come home and um yeah um just as I said trying to stay fit and sure just trying to stay healthy and just trying to get back on that field I presume you must be quite grateful to to Rob Penny for for allowing that to happen at such short notice as well and I obviously it probably helps that he he has the connection with Munster and probably knows what the draw is there you know yeah yeah and I think one thing that the Crusaders are really good at is looking after the player and rather than just the team and kind of thing so whatever is best for that individual they try their best to actually go out and make sure that's what they get and you know it's always been quite a family orientated place to play everyone looks after each other and they do the exact same thing here so it's obviously quite a good thing within the rugby circles that we look after our own but um, they were fantastic with the move you know they were fully supportive of it they understood the reasons why I wanted to come home and yeah backed me the whole way from it and I can't give them enough credit for helping me even get to this get to where I am today what um what caused the the itch to to want to come home? Because I remember I interviewed you almost, I'd say, nearly two years ago to the day, and obviously at the yeah. time you were, he was trying to get into the New Zealand squad, and and becoming All Black was the the immediate goal at that time. What what changed along the way? Um. Well, really, the whole COVID thing made a big big change of it. Um. I wasn't able to get home or be in Ireland for nearly four years, three and a half years, and of course when you'd be away for so long. So I'd lived outside of Ireland for over 10 years at that point. Well, before I came back home now and you miss things, you know, you miss weddings, you miss funerals, you miss parties or uh, family events and stuff. And then also just the fact that I hadn't actually seen my family in a long, long time. And um, it's just starting to get to the point where homesickness grew and I was trying to fight it off, pretend that it wasn't anything, but uh, it, you know, it always prevails and it comes through in the end. And it's just got to the point where I want to, my, I want to be back closer to my roots. And um, yeah, that was the reason, the whole reason why this move started basically. And um, yeah, just put feelings out to go home. And then now I'm here. In terms of the, the rugby itself, then stylistically, what have the, the adjustments been like getting used to, a different rugby environment or are there is it similar principles I suppose really similar styles of play at the moment between what you were used to down in, in New Zealand and, and what you're uh, playing with and playing against now for Munster yeah yeah like there's obviously there's always going to be similarities um, and stuff like that every team kind of takes little parts of every other team doesn't matter where you are they see a move that works and they're like oh we'll try that out and stuff like that so there's parts of that and stuff which help but the main thing was was just like you know the calls the language the um you know everything to do the set pieces and the plays that was the main thing that i found the most difficult part was to trying to get back into the rhythm of things and um kind of get everything ready and get my mind around really um for example in new zealand with call plays on the go and but here it's obviously pre preempted and we know what we're doing going into a line out so i was trying to figure that out again and get used to the system of play but um they've been great uh, they've had they've been real patient with me the coaches and players and helped me a lot uh, along the whole way through and yeah now i finally start to feel like i'm understanding what i'm doing and understanding the way we want to play and the role we have so it's been good. It's been a bit of a intense few weeks, but it's finally coming out now that I think I know what I'm doing. Yeah, like is it a is it a detail heavy environment with Monster? Uh yes. Well, it's detail heavy everywhere, really. When you get down to the nitty gritty stuff, and especially at the highest level, um, you really start going down to breaking down into every little small thing that you could have done better. And yeah, it is detail, but it's obviously you know, one main difference between the two styles of rugby is definitely up here. I feel like it's more physical. Uh, you get bigger forwards running at you. And yeah, you just wake up the next day a bit sore than you would have the day uh, down south. So um, just different parts of different things, you know. And then maybe in the Southern Hemisphere, you run more. So you wake up with sore legs and a bruised lung because you've been trying to breathe in too much. <laughs> to breathe in too much. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's just those kind of small little things that you don't think too much of a, at the time, but when you actually make the switch, it's, it's yeah, you can definitely tell. 
in terms of settling into Limerick then, how have you how have you found that? And how how many of the, the Munster lads would you have known previously? I know you were you played in school with Jeremy Lockman, for example. Were there were there any others you would have known from, from down the years? Uh well I went to school with Jeremy. Um so I knew him already. Um I went through the academy, like Crusader Academy, and obviously played against Alex Nankerville a lot. Um, so I knew him quite well as well. And then of course throughout the last season, John Ryan played against him twice. Um, with the Crusaders Chiefs and stuff like that when he was down south. So I knew a couple of boys, knew a handful, but uh, the majority of the team I didn't I didn't really know yet. So it was a bit of a, one of those like walking into school, a uh, new school on the first day kind of thing when you walk through those doors. But they were really welcoming. Everybody's been great and uh, be fitting in quite well and kind of, you know, feel like I'm at home now. It'll take a while though to, will it take a while to knock the, the bit of the New, the New Zealand accent off you? Uh, yeah, I think it's going to take a long time. Um, I've heard there's it's not too prevalent, well, from what I understand, but definitely some words that I say that are, are quite different to what I would have said about, uh, over a decade ago. So it might take a little bit longer, but, you know, I'm in Munster, I'm in the heart of Irish accent, so you might be quicker than we think. Yeah, you'll get a good Limerick twang on you. Hey, finally, before we wrap up, obviously a funny situation to be in where you travel to the other side of the world and I don't know how it'll work now, maybe with with being involved with Ireland the week before, but potentially could be coming up against your your old team when the Crusaders rock up to Porky Cueve on the at the start of February. Um like a strange situation to be in given how far across the world you'd have travelled. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the first things I thought about. Um <laughs> usually when you obviously if you switch teams within Ireland, you're obviously gonna play each other, mm. stuff like that. But I thought I would I was going to leave the Crusaders and, you know, you, you'd never see them or never, what's it called, have to be part of the, uh, them again. And like uh, playing them anyway. And then, of course, the game came up and I was like, oh, it's a weird, going to be a weird feeling, but it's going to be really cool. I'm really looking forward to that game. Um, uh, what's it called? It's just the fact that I'll be playing a bunch of boys that I know really well. And um, I've already been talking to them a little bit and they're sending me messages saying that they're really excited to come over and ready to get stuck into it too and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting playing your mates, but it always, when you play your friends, you seem to go a little bit harder. So it's going to be cool. I'm looking forward to it. Will you be roped in for any little bit of a recruitment drive or anything like that while you're there? Try to tap up a couple of players? Uh, I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. There's no, uh, there's no Irish fellas in that team. So they're all, they're all pretty happy to stay in New Zealand, I think. Yeah, well, look, it'll be a it'll be a great occasion. I was at the game against the the South African selection last year down in Porky Creve, and it was fantastic. So if if this is anything like that, it's going to be a a cracking atmosphere and a great game to play in. Um, Ali, thanks a million for joining us, and the very best of luck next week when you when you link up with the Irish camp. And I hope you really enjoy it. And good luck against your your old mates on uh on the 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 third, I think, is it of of February down in Porky Creve. And um, good luck if you're back this weekend as well, Ali. Thanks a million. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.